Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we are talking about the promised land today, um, specifically the land that was promised to Abraham. We have been talking about the children of Israel entering into this land under the leadership of Joshua. We've talked about Jericho and Achan and Rahab, and now we're going to take a step back and look at the land in the broader context of God's promise and his plan for history. Uh, So let's start with Abraham. He never inherited the land that God promised him in his lifetime, but he didn't seem too bothered by that. What does Hebrews 11 say? That he looked for a city. I should have looked this up. I was faking it. (laughs) But that foundation says, builder and maker is God. So he saw things by faith. And that's that gives a lot of people trouble. Uh, for the last couple hundred years in American church circles, there's been this emphasis on the land of Palestine, the land that Israel regained in 1948 when she became a new nation. The belief that this is the fulfillment of the prophecy, that this is what Abraham was waiting for, But that has as many problems as any other interpretation. Abraham is dead. And the prophets, they are dead, as the Jews said to Jesus. So what is all of this about? And that's what we want to talk about. What was the whole point of the promised land? What is the point of the promised land? And ultimately, what is the promised land? Well, clearly, the promised land was uh, Abraham, the man of faith, uh, waiting for um, a government that doesn't recognize him to be instituted in the 20th century. <laughs> Obviously. Oh, wait, let's maybe reconsider that one. We we have a nation sitting in Palestine that does not recognize Jesus as Messiah and therefore has rejected the faith of Abraham. So what exactly are we supposed to do with that? And And the church has taken a number of approaches. Well, it's close enough for now. Jesus will fix it. Or no, it really isn't close enough, but Jesus will fix it when he comes back. <laughs> I think the not close enough is we need to rebuild the temple and then it'll be close enough, right? Yeah, well, for some, some some Christians are actually contributing to mm-hmm. um, rebuilding the temple. My daughter recently was told by her pastor, and we don't contribute to that. That's not a good thing. We no money for building the temple. Well, he got that one right. <laughs> He's actually got a lot right. But uh, there's still that that view of prophecy that seems very fascinated with, obsessed with, is centered around Israel, Canaan, the land, and the physical structure, the temple, the tribal divisions, even the sacrifices and priesthood. Uh, when I was a kid, the Schofield Reference Bible was a very popular thing. Most Christians who weren't explicitly Presbyterian, Reformed, or Lutheran generally had it as their study Bible. And uh, its notes were very clear that uh, Israel is supposed to be back in the land. And once she gets there, sooner or later, the temple will be rebuilt. The sacrifices reinstituted, the priesthood reinstalled. And then during the thousand year millennium, Jesus will rule over that land and from that land over the rest of the world. And this is what Abraham expected. The problem is that's not what God said. And it's not what the Bible says Abraham expected. We keep running into this this, this uncomfortable phrase, forever. Forever is not a thousand years. Forever is not even a really long time. Uh, what God was promising Abraham was something that defies death, that goes beyond resurrection. It's something that is most literally eternal. And to think that that prophecy, that promise could be fulfilled while in, in its fullness and in all of its extent, while death has, well, the matter of death has not been settled, while sin has not been settled, is it's really to misread scripture. And the concern of scripture from the fall of Adam forward is God's relationship with man. Man's a sinner, man's a rebel. He's broken God's law. He is guilty, deserving of wrath, and he is spiritually polluted. He hates God, hates his neighbor, and, and wouldn't like to sit and have supper with God if he could. 
that's the problem. And you're putting people in a particular piece of real estate and surrounding them by ceremonies and rites isn't going to fix that. And so when God comes to Abraham in Mesopotamia, in, in the very shadow of, uh, of Babel, and says, I have some place for you to go. I've got something for you to do. And um, you're going to be great. And I'm going to give you a seed. And in that seed, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed. I, I think the word bless is the thing that gets ignored the most. We, we don't stop and say, what, what, what is blessing? And we've talked about this before. So see previous episodes. But if you read through Galatians 3, there are two things that Paul brings uh, to light. Great emphasis he brings. First of all, the justification by faith, being righteous with God by faith alone. Abraham, as the father of all who believe, it was, we're told it was accounted, his faith was counted for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith are the same are the children of Abraham. So that for one. The other is the blessing of Abraham should come upon the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. We might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, sanctification, indwelling of the Holy Spirit with all that implies. So that's what Abraham was most concerned with, that blessing. Because compared to that, inheriting some real estate really doesn't amount to whole, holy life. What Abraham heard was, in all in your seed, all the nations of the world are going to be justified and sanctified. They're going to be declared righteous before me, and they're going to be united to me through the seed and the indwelling spirit. Oh, and there's a land you need to be in so we can make this work. Once you begin to read the Old Testament in that light, things begin to make a whole lot more sense, especially when you get to the New Testament. You're not suddenly have to, having to learn a brand new religion with mm -hmm. new rules and new principles and new priorities. And of course, that's Which is, what... Go ahead. Oh, one of the conflicts of... The early church. We were just talking about this recently in Acts, how that's what it sounded like to the Jews of the time, that, wait a second, you mean the Gentiles don't have to be circumcised? You mean they don't have to keep kosher? You mean this? You mean that? Well, what have we been doing? No. It's kind of revolutionary. Because, in fact, they did miss the point, and they did turn it into another sort of religion. And this was Jesus' constant conflict with the Pharisees and Sadducees, that they had invented a new religion out of the materials of the Old Covenant, but not in the spirit of the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was looking forward to Messiah and what he would accomplish and was keeping Israel protected in a holding pattern until Messiah should come. But the scope of the promise was always, all nations shall be blessed. And the blessing wasn't having political power. It wasn't having uh, mineral resources, old oil or gold or any such thing. Uh, it wasn't even peace on earth. It was having a right relationship with God through the Messiah and having the power of the Holy Spirit within themselves to walk with God. That's that's what God was promising. And he was promising on a worldwide scale. So why did it, why was Abraham not worried that he didn't get that in his lifetime? He was more patient than we are. <laughs> we want everything right now. We want even if it's through the gospel, we want the worldwide revival to begin right now and we expect it to be done in our lifetime. Come on, God, get with it here. Here are your great promises. Why is this taking so long? Which, of course, Israel could have complained about. 4,000 years just to get started? <laughs> yeah. Four generations and my seed's going to be in a land that's not theirs. They're going to be oppressed and enslaved. Yeah, that's about right. And then we'll go from there. Sometimes, you, you know, looking at the genealogy, I have to think, well, whose fault was it that it took, quote, so long, unquote? Specifically, I'm thinking of Judah and the um, begetting of, oh, who is it? With Tamar. Pharaohs? Pharaohs and, yeah, the twins. Right. Where now there's the 10 generations that have to pass. Right. Because... For 10 generations, a bastard child cannot enter into the presence of the Lord, right? So it's like, well, this could have been a quick thing, but now we have to wait 10 generations. Yeah. On the, on the one hand, as, as good Calvinists, we freely admit God's predestination and sovereign plan mm -hmm. and the wisdom of said plan and 
Oh, but yeah. I, when we look at human responsibility, um, yeah, God's people kind of stretched it out unnecessarily. Um, but it wasn't unnecessary from God's point of view. He had things that right. needed to happen, stories he wanted to tell, a book he wanted to write mm -hmm. that would contain everything that the Bible actually does have. So he knew what he was doing, but that doesn't yeah. excuse God's people from lameness any more than it excuses the church in the 21st century from lack of evangelism. But it'll be so much cooler story with, yeah, but that doesn't, no. Yeah, God's story is <laughs> going to be wonderful. You had a job to do. <laughs> yeah, we have a job to do. God's story is going to be great. And, and part of the greatness will be how we screwed it up and how he rescued us again and again. And how it looked like everything hung by a thread and he stepped in and did something incredible or something sneaky. And, and the gospel exploded across the planet yet again. And we'll sit back through all eternity and enjoy the story. And yet we will know, you know, could have happened faster. Could have happened with less bloodshed. Could have happened with less suffering. Could have happened with me being far more faithful than I was, not breaking God's heart. So, you know, got all that. So we have Abraham who's told that in God's good time, and it's going to be at least four generations before they even get back to the promised land. Um, God's going to start this process in which his seed will inherit the land. And in that seed, all nations of the earth will be blessed. Now, that brings us back to Galatians 3, because Paul has something very specific to say about those words, unto thy seed. This is Galatians 3.16. Now, to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, unto thy seed, which is Christ which is the Messiah. So every time that God spoke, and, and the word's important because he does add the, the uh, preposition unto thy seed. And every time there's an unto in God's promises to Abraham, it's the land that's in view. I will give this land unto your seed. And Paul says, yeah, that seed, that wasn't Israel as such. That was Messiah. That was Christ. Because it says seed, not seeds. Now, this is a matter of a uh, fine point of, of Hebrew grammar that I'm not fully qualified to speak on, but Paul does a pretty good job for us here. Uh, from what he goes on to say, there is seed in the sense of many individual seeds. And he's saying that's not what it says. It doesn't say many individual seeds. It says one seed, but that seed may be a collective. But he says that seed is Like Christ. sheep or fish or deer. Well, a little bit more than that, because here in Galatians 3, he says the seed is Christ. And then this is what he says later on. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In other words, Christ is more than just Jesus of Nazareth. Christ is Christ together with his body and bride. If we have been baptized into Christ, if we've been united to Christ by his spirit, then we are extensions of Christ. We are members of Christ, partakers of his anointing. And therefore, what is true of Jesus must be true of us. He's the first fruits, we're the harvest. And you can think of all the other metaphors that the Bible uses. He's the chief cornerstone, we're the temple. But it's not that we get the blessings individually because of a direct relationship with God. What we get, we get in Jesus, and we get because of Jesus. So he's the seed, and if we're in him, then we're also the seed. But if we're not in him, bum, 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 then there's a problem. And, and this is a good deal of what uh, Paul talks about in what remains of Galatians and also what he talks about in Romans 9, the grand chapter on uh, predestination and election. Who exactly is Israel? If anybody who's ever had to deal with the with arguments about predestination, I'm sure has been pointed toward Romans 9 at some point, whether they've dealt with it or not is another issue. But Paul in wrestling with with what's happening to Israel in his day, he looks about him and Israel as a nation is apostate. There is a remnant that God is saving. It's the nucleus of the New Testament church. And he says, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish 
that myself are accursed from Christ, from my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises, whose are the fathers, and of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who was over all, God blessed forever. Amen. Now, all of those are wonderful outward privileges that Israel has had, and this Israel is clearly identifiable with history. We know who Israel was. We know who the fathers were. We know the outward privileges. We know the external details of the covenants. Uh, and we know the bloodline through whom Jesus came. And so Paul has to face this and say, well, what happens to them now? Uh, is God going to let them walk away into darkness? Are they going to stumble and fall forever? And he says this, not as though the word of God has taken that effect, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel, neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now he's referencing the passage in Genesis where Abram is having to decide what to do with Ishmael. We have Ishmael, who is a true bloodline son of Abram. He's Abraham's seed, genetically, DNA, however you want to measure it out. And we've got Isaac the child of the promise, the child born by miracle, who is also Abraham's seed. So they're both my seed, and God, can we know? No. In Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, the child born by fleshly means and contrary to the promise, in fact, in violation of God's law, because he took a second wife, that child's going to be rejected. And the promise and the covenant line is going to go through Isaac, and this is what Paul says here. And Isaac shall they see to be called, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, born by purely fleshly means and dependence upon purely fleshly means. These are not the children of God. Being physically descended from Abraham does not make you a child of God. That's what Paul is saying. But the children of the promise are counted for the seed. So the seed, who ultimately is Christ, those who make up the seed with him are those who are children of the promise, as Isaac was. For this is the word of promise, at this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah had conceived by one, even by her father Isaac, the children having not yet, uh, being not yet born, having done neither good nor evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. It was said to her, the elder shall serve the younger, as it's written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now, this has lots to say about divine precedent, predestination, election, all that. But the, the main avenue of his argument is Esau was a child of Abraham, but he was rejected. He was rejected from the womb. So God's grace is bypassing nature. It's bypassing bloodline. It's bypassing uh, all the externals, even that of family covenant. And it's working on another level altogether, that of promise and of faith. And the true Israel is the one that receives and believes the promise and trusts God for its fulfillment rather than resting in its own merits, however noble it may think those merits may be at times. And this is what Paul comes back to in Galatians. And here I'm looking at chapter 4, one of my favorite sections. Chapter 4 of Galatians, Paul writes... Um, in verse 21, tell me, you that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it's written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. It doesn't mean that they didn't happen or that's fiction, but that there's a spiritual lesson involved. For these are the two covenants, two ways of relating to God. The one from Mount Sinai considered in and of itself as a program of self-righteousness and good works, which gendereth the bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is in, and is in bondage with her children, the religion of Pharisaism. Do this and live. They thought because they had the mark of circumcision, and they had these promises, and they had these dietary laws, and they had these sacrifices, and this priesthood, and all these ceremonies, that they were bound for heaven and they were God's favorites and nothing could take that away from them, no matter what their personal moral character might be. And that, the Jerusalem of Paul's day, the Jerusalem that crucified Christ and killed the prophets, is in the same boat with 
Ishmael and Hagar and all those who would seek God by works righteousness. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. Over against the earthly Jerusalem, there's a heavenly Jerusalem, a new Jerusalem, which this podcast is kind of named after, halting towards Zion. Uh, it's above in the sense that, well, our king is above. Our king sits at the right hand of the throne of God. And given how many Christians there have been in earth's history, probably the greater population of the city is in heaven as well. But it, had out, it certainly has outposts in earth. The Jerusalem which is above is, I'm sorry, the Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. For it's written, Rejoice thou barren. And this is a reference to Isaiah 54 which talks about the spread and the growth of God's people. Rejoice thou barren, the barest not, break forth and cry thou that prevailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. So he takes Old Testament prophecies, prophecies that everyone would have thought, well, this is for Israel. Yes, which Israel? Israel according to the flesh or to those who believe the promises because they're part of the Messiah. They're grafted in, uh, united to, in communion with the coming Messiah by faith by the Spirit. Now we, brethren, as Isaac were, are children of the promise. And he's talking to Christians. Yes, there are Jews, Israelites, who are children of the flesh and biologically are children of Abraham. But speaking to Gentile Christians, he's saying, no, we're we like Isaac. We're the children of God, not because of our fleshly birth and sin, but because of our faith, because we have received the Spirit. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Well, Jews according to the flesh were persecuting Christians. And the Judaizers within Galatia were persecuting those who were taking a firm stand for the gospel. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman or her son. The son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman. But the free. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Now, what what Paul just did here, if any good Jew actually got this, he'd be absolutely horrified and outraged because he, Paul has basically said that those who are Jews according to the flesh, but not according to faith, are in the same class as their Arab neighbors. They're physically descended from Abraham and they don't know God. So what's the difference in Israel can claim? But we have promises that must be received by faith in the Messiah, which you have steadfastly refused to do. And that puts you outside the camp, outside of your own Messiah. Now, as Paul goes, we, we stop in Galatians 9, as we go into Galatians 10 and 11, Paul holds out hope that one day Israel will become jealous of the privileges that the church has inherited mm -hmm. and will come back in Romans 10 and 11. 10 and 11, 11 especially. Uh, Paul uses the figure of the uh, of the olive tree, one olive tree with its roots in the fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, natural branches. I believe he gets were broken off, foreign alien branches, Gentiles graft in branches from a wild olive tree, but only one tree. And he says, but if God could do that, if God could graft in the Gentiles, couldn't He graft His own people, those who once were not strangers to the covenants of promise, who once waited for Messiah, couldn't he graft them back in? Yes, he could. And if he were to do that, the results would be amazing. But they have to come the same way everyone else comes. They have to come through faith in Christ. And so then back to this whole thing of the promise land. What is it that Abraham was looking for? I think, first of all, we have to say that he was looking for more than Palestine. Palestine had a role to play. We'll get to that in a second. But from the beginning, before God even mentioned Palestine, I just I was reading uh, Genesis 12 before we started, just to make sure I saw the wording. And you know what? The first time he mentions the promise, there's no mention of the land. God says, come to a place I'm going to show you, but he doesn't promise to give it to him. What he promises is all nations blessed. That's the starting promise. And only as, as Genesis develops, does God add in, oh, and by the way, your seed, singular, will get this land. Oh, and your seed, collective, will be as numerous as the stars of heaven, which fits right in with, in your seed, all nations will be blessed. Why was Abraham willing to wait? Why, was, why did he not expect everything right away? He wanted to see the world saved. He wanted the conversion of all the heathen nations. He wanted all peoples everywhere to receive this good news 
of justification by faith and sanctification by the Spirit. And he kind of figured it might take a while. Now, whether he knew exactly how long is something else again. Being human, he may have been a bit short-sighted too. But he realized that even though he might die before he saw it, doesn't mean God had failed. Because Abraham ultimately isn't dead. He's going to come back to life. And as he stands in heaven and greets each new convert who comes through the pearly gates, as it were, figure of speech, comes, dies and goes to be with Jesus, he's there and sees another son, another daughter. Hey, three more sons. Hey, a hundred more daughters over there. Hey, and he is there rejoicing in how God is working out this promise and handing him the world. And it'd be, it'd be, it'd be interesting to know how much the saints in glory know what passes on earth. Do they uh, do they get news as as every you know as everybody dies and goes to heaven? Does everyone mock them and say, "What's going on? What are the headlights? What's God doing down there?" Or do they or does God just say, "You know what? You have to wait. And you must wait until the end of the story. Then all will be told." Uh, well, we <laughs> they have know. a radio announcer. Yeah, <laughs> like reading the baseball news off the ticker tape. <laughs> <laughs> but in the meantime, on this in this world. And this is important. God did promise him the, the world, not just the people in it, but the planet. And there's a lot about that. And we need not, again, Gnostic bell, ding. Oh, we, I have uh, it. Hold on. <laughs> we need not to. <laughs> oh, we actually have a Gnostic bell now. That's awesome. We actually have a Gnosticism bell. Isn't that nice? Okay, that was impressive. <laughs> uh, it, it is easy. And, and the church has sometimes done this to say, well, the promised land is heaven. So, yeah, he gets heaven. No, the promised land's not heaven. The promised land is the fulfillment of the Great Commission. It's when all nations here and in heaven, on earth and in heaven, are blessed, are all the seed of Abraham, and all nations are Jesus' disciples. Uh, Romans 4, we're told that Paul, or that Paul tells us that Abraham knew he would be heir of the world, that that was the promise. Uh, Jesus said the meek shall inherit the earth. And again, well, earth is a symbol. Of, earth means land, and the land's a symbol of heaven, so it means the meek get to go to heaven. No. <laughs> uh, the promise is about this world and this reality, and therefore it began in this world and this reality. Why? And so we come to it. So what's the big deal with the promised land? Well, from the time that, that Abraham's story be, begins to go somewhere, when Isaac is, is born and then God's called to, or God calls him to sacrifice him, and we have that whole resurrection motif. God says, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. It being God providing a substitute. And so what's kind of been implied, this is Emmanuel's land. This is Messiah's land. Now we've given something concrete. Here's the place in these mountains, the mountains of Moriah, round about Jerusalem. Somewhere in one of these mountains, God will provide a sacrifice. That's why this land is important. God has something to work out in time, on earth, and in history. Something that physically has to happen to God in the flesh. And that's what makes the promised land so important. It makes it so important that God's people be there when the time comes. Canaan's nice and all. There was a time when it was as the Garden of the Lord, as the Garden of Eden. Not so much anymore. Uh, but that's again, that's trivial compared to what God wrought in that land. He brought his son into that land to give his life an atonement for sin. And then he raised him from the dead. And it was from that land that the gospel began to pour out into the whole world. That's what's important. Now, does that mean that God's people have, well, we had, we had Canaan, we don't need it anymore? No, we need everything because God owns everything. God still has a plan for the entire earth. Yeah. And <laughs> including that, includes, that plot of land. Including Palestine, including Canaan. God hasn't given up any of it. Jesus has not given up his claims. The We all know the uh, the Christmas sermon of Isaiah that begins with um, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and call his name Emmanuel, and goes on to, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. A number of, of very famous messianic lines in uh, Isaiah 7 through 12. But in the midst of it all, as Isaiah prophesies the coming of the Assyrian armies, he's describing Assyria as, as if it's a great bird that's sweeping down and spreading out its wings over thy land, O Emmanuel. 
in the middle of Israel's apostasy and the announcing of her punishment, the father turns to the son and says, yeah, Syria's coming into your land, my son, into your land, O Emmanuel. It is your land. Well, I'm going to go take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is not going to throw away Palestine. Who exactly will live there? Well, we do. We are told one thing. The nation that will not serve thee will perish. So whoever holds it in the long run will be a people that believes God, believes in the Messiah, trusts his word, believes his gospel. And how that will work out, God has not given us a detailed roadmap, nor do we need one. And so and it could, could be a very long run. It could be a very long yeah. run. You mean like a hundred years or so? <laughs> well, and it's also very interesting to to note since this land is is called Emmanuel's land. I believe there's a hymn in the Trinity hymnal that yes. has that exact mm -hmm. line. It's really interesting to note how uh, the the individuals you mentioned at the start of this uh, podcast recording are so adamant about ceding it more or less to people that don't acknowledge Emmanuel. Mm. And it, it's like they take all the promises that are given to Israel, which are messianic in nature right. and just mm -hmm. say, well, it doesn't matter that they reject God's Messiah. They're, they're children of the promise by birth. So we have to acknowledge that they're going to get it by that virtue, even though at every step it's, it's about, the Messiah. You know, you just said something that threw another issue into stark relief for me. I'm going to try to be careful because we don't want to offend people needlessly. But some of these same people who would say, but they're Israelites by covenant, they get the promises automatically, will turn and look at their own children and say, well, yes, they're my mm -hmm. children, but they don't have anything until they themselves personally trust in Jesus, hmm. including the sacrament, the sacrament um, of initiation. Um, Jews were circumcised and they get included in all the outward promises, apparently, but they look at their own children sometimes and say, yeah, but not until my children reaches an age of accountability and not until he has made profession of faith himself, can he have a relationship with God that God's going to honor. That seems to be plain contradictory to me now that I think about it. I'm not sure why I haven't thought about it before. But mm -hmm. it's something, these are real issues. How the externals of the covenant relate to the internal reality. As Paul was describing Israel's privilege, he says that to them belong the covenants of promise. He just, that isn't enough. The covenant is in part outward and part inward, and one can uh, receive the waters of baptism, come to the Lord's Supper, be a church member, attend worship every Lord's Day. You know, his heart can be far from God. Well, and it goes yet, back to Romans 9, where yeah. if, if the church is the continuation of the covenant community that Israel was, all those who believe in God, God's Messiah, then mm -hmm. we're, we're still dealing with the same principle of visible, invisible... Distinction, right. where yeah. not all who are of the church are the church, the church. as well. Yeah. It, it it applies mm -hmm. equally. Yes, it does, um, and that's something we try to communicate to our covenant children. And I have found in my experience that we don't always succeed. Uh, it seems that for every time we say covenant, we need to say gospel. In fact, probably mm -hmm. for every time we say covenant, we need to say gospel twice. Because I have repeatedly run into good covenant children. You know, they did it all. Christian school, homeschool, whatever, you know. Uh, Catechesis. Catechism class, confirmation, baptized as an infant. They know their systematics. And yet someplace in their late high school or college years, or maybe as young Barry's, they they begin to question the faith and even flatly to turn away from it, or they or they reject covenant theology in favor of something else that's Christian, but it's not what they learned. And you have to ask yourself, what happened? 
Now, we can appeal to divine sovereignty. Well, God did not ordain that they should come to a proper saving knowledge of Christ. Well, we before be we get there, <laughs> we should be thinking, is there something that we could have corrected that we should yeah. be careful of going forward? Yeah. Not that it's all up to us, but we have responsibilities. So one of our first questions should be, should it not? Yeah, the first Whether question should had... be, did, did we screw up? Did, and and mm -hmm. when it starts becoming collective on a large scale, I think it's more imperative that we ask those questions. Did we thoroughly communicate the gospel? I, I may have used this, this story already, but I'll, I'll use it again because it's relevant. I was talking to a gentleman, fine Christian uh, dad, and he told me that uh, his children were still fairly young, but old enough to be capable of rational conversation. He, he asked him, so uh, what does it mean to be a Christian? How, did you, how, how are you Christians? Well, because we go to Christian school, we were homeschooled, and then we went to Christian school, we have catechism class. Like, no, 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 what have I done? Uh, well, being a Christian is all about what you that. do, clearly. Yeah, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> well, the funny thing is, you know, you never know how long it's going to take, how many repetitions it's going to take for that to click. Yeah. I mean, I can pinpoint the moment in Sunday school when I understood the gospel, and it was not until sixth grade. Yeah. And I had heard the gospel a lot more times before that. <laughs> I know because it's not, because again, it's not something we do for other people either. Right. Is that if, yeah. we if we had just said it right, if we had just mentioned use this text instead of that, if we use this phraseology rather than that, then if we had sat down on one to one and looked them in the eye and made sure they were listening, slap them a little maybe, then maybe no, it's as you said. Uh, our uh, former pastor, quoting uh, a gentleman he had met once upon a time, has this story. And the gentleman said, well, for years I heard the gospel, and I heard the gospel, and I heard the gospel, and I heard the gospel. Then I heard the gospel. Mm -hmm. And it, yes, God's sovereign grace, God's sovereign time. But you know what? If the gospel's not there, then they're not going to believe it. We can't compel belief. We can't initiate regeneration. But at the very least, we can make sure that the gospel is right under their noses, something they trip on every time they move. <laughs> yeah. And they may attribute it to all kinds of things, and they may not see it for what it is. But at least we have to do that. Another a young man who was uh, who were talking about him disciplining his children in, in, in the broad sense, but also in terms of, of giving spanks. And he said, well, you know, I just, um, you know, I, I tell them what they did wrong and, and we hug them and give them a spank and hug them some more and send them on the way. Do you explain the gospel to them? Well, no, I thought that was just taken for granted. Mm -hmm. uh, Seems like a lot of churches do that too. Uh, um, there was a, uh, a lady who uh, applied for teaching our school. And our, our headmaster is very wise, particularly in this area. And he, one of his uh, questions that he asks now is, how would you present the gospel to, you know, what a child of the age you're going to be teaching, 10-year-old, 6-year-old, whatever. And this woman says, well, why would I have to do that? These, okay. they, all of these children go to church, right? Well, let's say that somehow they missed it at church. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure they would pick it up someplace. I don't know why I would have to be the one to tell them. She didn't get the job. Mm -hmm. Christian education is first and foremost education of the gospel. And sometimes you, you let it come up naturally, because it does. And sometimes you say, all right, we need to talk about the gospel again right now. <laughs> uh, because our fleshly nature is so hardened against it. We want something we can do, something that will make us feel good about us, something we can pat, pat ourselves uh, on the back about. And as I've said before, if this podcast does nothing else but irritate people on this one point, <laughs> then we've done our job. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of things to talk about. There's a lot of theology and philosophy we enjoy discussing. But if we don't show people Jesus, if people can walk away from this podcast saying, well, that didn't seem so uniquely Christian to me, we've blown it. Mm -hmm. and so I think we try, I think we all try every time 
to bring our discussion back to Jesus, to his perfect righteousness, his shed blood, and to uh, the gospel that must be received by faith alone plus nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Back to the land for a moment. Mm -hmm. There's so much comfort in God's choosing the land ahead of time. Because this is all about Jesus. This is all about the promise. God says, I'm going to provide a Messiah for you. Yeah. Our first question should be when and where. Yeah. <laughs> like if, if there's not a when and there's not a where, it's not really happening. And right. so we see Israel asking through the Psalms, through the prophets, all, all, all the way through the Old Testament, how long, O oh Lord? How when are you going to do Lord? this? You said when. But he already gave us the where. That was never a question. Yeah. And so I think that's such an image of God's preparation. I mean, it's not an image of God's preparation. It is God's preparation. It is God's preparation. This is the place. Yeah. This is the place. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah. And therefore, this place, this physical locale, this geography, this topography on the planet Earth has immense value to God and to all human souls. If God would hang everything on a piece of real estate, after a manner of speaking, yes, he did. Because if that place isn't there, then there will be no time when anything can happen. And uh, mm -hmm. Satan spent a lot of time trying to bring that place under his dominion, both spiritually and militarily, politically. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, God always managed to sneak his people back into it and give them just as much as they needed to be there when Messiah came. And then, of course, the great joke but wait, we have this powerful empire that's controlling it all. Let's have the powerful empire arrange for Messiah to actually go to Bethlehem. <laughs> yeah. Wait, no, that's not fair. They're supposed and to work Egypt. for me. <laughs> yeah, then we'll use Egypt as a hiding spot. Yeah. Mm. Yes, no Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. We're not in, 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 in emphasizing the spiritual reality. Spiritual here is capitalized. We're emphasizing the work and presence and power of the Holy Spirit through the gospel in all of this. The power to transform a world, to bring a world to Christ. Mm. We're not leaving the world behind. We're not turning the promises into phantom, ghostly things. We're simply grabbing it all mm -hmm. for Jesus. Not for any political entity, whether it be Israel or a theocratic church. We are saying... Jesus has claims on this planet, and he is putting them into effect. He is subduing the world himself his way, mm -hmm. not ours. We would do it other ways. Our ways stink. <laughs> his ways, his ways are good. His words are his ways are gracious. Oh, and something you said just reminded me when, when it, I mean, think of all the widely varied. Um, cults that have mm. shown up where you know you you never hear of them until it's like 37 people were found dead as they were awaiting a comet <laughs> to take them away from planet earth yeah granted that's not there's not necessarily that many of those kind but you know <laughs> the, the 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 kind of idea where it's like the, the salvation is found in leaving behind earth mm -hmm. particularly because you know it's bad in some way and there are ways in which it is bad but it's not this wholly incorruptible thing by virtue of, you know, being made of stuff. <laughs> Do either of yeah, you remember? I mean, Go ahead. Oh, just the, the concept of something being redeemable. Mm -hmm. um, and from our perspective, nothing is redeemable. Everything is either incorrupt or corrupt. And if it's incorrupt, it will be corrupt as soon as humans get their hands on it. And yet God created this category of, yes, it's corrupt. And yet I'm not done with it. This is going to be good. Yeah. Do either of you remember a movie called Time Bandits? <laughs> I remember it scarring me as a child. I haven't seen it since I was five years I old. I believe I've only seen the last 20 minutes as it was airing on cable. <laughs> That's about right. Um, nor, nor do you need to see any more. But there is a line where they... The dwarves, they were dwarves, pick up the charred remains of what was more or less Satan. And they point out and say, it's concentrated evil. <laughs> and so evil actually takes on a physical presence in this ash that they're holding, oh which they immediately get rid of. But that's 
yeah, that, that's a form of Manichaeanism, that physical things are evil. And, and the church, the American church has, you know, dumped a lot of stuff into that category. Playing cards, makeup, DVDs. Jeans. Um, yeah. You know, you, you go down the list. The, no, the thing itself is evil. No, things aren't evil. Even, even things that are that we have no good use for, like idols, are not evil because there's some kind of sinful power wrapped up in them. It's just that we are so fascinated by them and our depravity that we can't find a good use for what could otherwise have just been a pretty museum piece or a painting or something. Mm-hmm. There are things, and, and Paul's clear about this, there are things that all of the evil is not in them we can't find a good use for, and therefore they need to be gotten rid of. But that list is real limited. Mm-hmm. Most things have a good and simple use. And Paul is not afraid to say all things are lawful for me. But lawful doesn't mean I can use everything any way I want. We have to use things in terms of God's word for God's glory, for his kingdom and his righteousness. And so Christianity, again, it's not Manichaean, it's not Gnostic. It is in some ways a very worldly religion. I mean, God invented food and sex and work and sweat and uh, beauty and art and all kinds of things that are not bad. They have great potential to glorify him. But we would ruin everything if we could. We try really hard. And that's why Messiah had to come. Not because the world was hopeless, but because the only hope was God himself. Because we got nothing. Yeah. It's another cheery note to end on, <laughs> except this time it actually is because God did that. God um, did that. So, <laughs> God did not so abandon us to ourselves. Yeah. Praise be. Let's wrap up with some recommendations at this point. Uh, ooh, ooh, do you have I've one, got one. I got yes, one. Great. Thanks to my daughter, Haley, who was busy <laughs> cooking in the kitchen beside me. She suggested um, that I recommend teaching your children to cook. I think this is a wonderful thing. Our <laughs> oldest started cooking when she was quite young and for years got up every morning and made breakfast for us. And so she's a master oh. of breakfast. And then for a couple of years, I turned it over to the other two and they alternated in breakfast. So we have breakfast down, but now they are all um, learning at, at various stages in, in their uh, expertise to cook wonderful meals. And um, Haley's working on enchiladas right now for the first time. I have run into far too many people, adults, often women, who say, my mother never taught me anything about cooking because it was too... In the time she could explain it to me, she could just as well do it herself. Or she didn't want to burden me. She wanted to be responsible for those things. You know, all this kind of, if you don't teach your children to cook, one, they can't cook for you. And they love cooking <laughs> for you. They think it's fun to cook for you if it was fun for you to teach them. And they can cook for themselves and they can cook for their friends and they will never starve. And when they get married, when we got, my wife and I got married, she cooked everything that went in the oven. I cooked the things largely that went on top of the oven, especially if oil was involved or grease. If it involves grease that could splatter, I did that. Now she does, now she does it all. But her mother had not really taught her how do you, how do you flip eggs? How do you turn bacon? Well, they didn't do grease and and, and 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 such so much. So between the two of us, we pulled off pretty good uh, food making service there at the beginning. But it is a good and profitable thing to teach your children to cook and then to allow them to cook. And might you get a few kind of weird meals? Yeah, you might. But I've heard, I've tasted more weird meals from adults than I ever <laughs> have from my girls. Everything my girls have made, I liked and I could eat. There have been a few meals made by adults when we were sick. You know, they, they, they bring you those meals to take care of you that we, they, they end up <laughs> in the garbage can because they were just, or, anyway, it's the thought that counts, right? Go. Yeah, it's the thought that counts. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> we're not Gnostics. <laughs> All right. My recommendation for the day is going to be T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets. I don't actually think it's his best work. I think The Wasteland is probably his best work. But I really enjoy Four Quartets, and it's rewarding every time you read it. If you read it out loud, that's even better, but it might take a while. But you can read the whole thing silently in, I don't know, probably less than an hour. Um, But it's just lovely. Lots of meditations on history and your place in it and your 
relation to people who have come before you. Uh, and it's just extraordinarily beautiful. So okay, now Eliot's I have to go back and read quartets. it. <laughs> <laughs> I've done my job here. <laughs> All right. um, as far as my recommendation, I'm going to go uh, very biblical and recommend what uh, St. James recommends, which is religion that is pure and undefiled to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world, which feels like a Jesus juke, but it is a excellent reminder <laughs> to, uh, to remember that that's, that's part of the Christian life. It's not, it's not all mm -hmm. theology discussions, although it is mm -hmm. certainly not devoid of that. And it's not just fuzzy feelings about God, though it may certainly include those. It is also to visit the people who are actually hurting and to, mm -hmm. Keep yourself holy. Good reminder, Brian. Thank you. That was convicting somehow. <laughs> I'm afraid of thinking why it might have been convicting. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys both so much for this discussion. It's been such a pleasure. A thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. A special thanks to one of our listeners, our friend Michael, who gave us the Gnosticism bell. <laughs> that was a special gift from a listener. So we are glad to have that. It, he actually gave it to us quite some time ago, but with packing and moving and unpacking, today was the first time we could actually pull it out and use it. <laughs> uh, thanks also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you helping keep the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, which is anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Oh, if you'd like thing. to get in. Oh, yeah. If you are listening in Scotland. Oh, yes. Email us and tell us who in the world you are and how you came upon us. We are curious. Yes, we just learned that uh, the UK has overtaken Ireland as the second most uh, most listeningest country <laughs> on our roster. <laughs> and we have some suspicions about England, but we have like 5% of the UK population is in Scotland and we don't know who you are, so, but we'd love to hear from you. Uh, so please send us an email. You can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, other ways to get in touch with us, you can visit our Facebook page, which is called Halting Towards Zion. You can follow us on YouTube or on Rumble. And I think that's about everywhere we are. On your favorite podcast catcher, leave us a five-star review if you like us. That's all we have for this evening. See you next time. Bye.